Welcome to Talking in Stations, a podcast about EVE Online. I am Matterall here with the gang. We're going to talk about EVE Online for the next hour to two. And uh, we'll be hitting the major topics today uh, that you have heard about in EVE Online. Specifically, the M2 camp and the state of the war in Delve, among other things. Uh, but first, I want to say, here's a summary of the week. So on Talking in Stations, our Newsday program... On Monday, we had a reaction stream to the interview with CCP Ritati, which, uh, depending on who you talk to, had some, some interesting things in it or not interesting things at all. And on Tuesday, we took a look at life in Pashvan and what it was like with uh, Gabriel uh, Bemenak. And on Wednesday, we had industry techniques. We were talking with Shakin, who's, in a, who's a builder in Empire Space in Amar. And uh, also Nick Bison was along for the ride there. On Thursday, we had Minmatar Space Mining with the one and only Astraeus Khan. And he told us all about uh, what it's like to multi-box 14 orcas and uh, his career in EVE Online. So that was very interesting. Uh, Rundle was there for that and Nick Bison also as well. And then... On Friday, we had a very special show recorded a bit early called I Spy Maya, the Double Agent. And that was one of the coolest stories I've heard in a long time about a player that joined Test and was able to, from Test's group, uh, intelligence group, the TIA, was able to infiltrate uh, Guardians of the Galaxies over a period of three years. And uh, not only uh, was she able to eliminate rival spies, but uh, she became the spy master for Guardians of the Galaxy and was actually spying on other groups on their behalf. So that was a very intricate story. It went about four levels deep uh, before finally it all came to an end when NCPL or PandaFam uh, took out Guardians of the Galaxy, known as Dead Coalition later. And that ended her mission. And so she took a year off after that. And she is now back uh, as a spy handler herself, as a veteran agent. So, great story. That was on Friday called I Spy Maya, the Double Agent. Okay, don't forget, you can get your news in the game if you want. I was going to say online, but it is online. In the game, if you, uh, you want to get your EVE newspaper from Talking in Stations, it's called uh, TIS News. So get our EVE newspaper uh, called TIS News. While in EVE, open your mail window at the bottom left, find the button called Add Mailing List, and use it, and type TIS News. Then you'll get player news, um, player-created news in your in-game client every day. It's like a newspaper. Your paper boy will drop it off. You don't have to do anything. Okay, today... Um, we're going to talk about M2, uh, talk about what's going on with Fraternity, possibly, and then, uh, of course, we're going to talk about all the other stuff. So let's uh, introduce Elise from Pandemic Legion. How are you doing, Elise? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. It was a great series of shows this week that you went over. Um, I was fascinated by so many of them, and they're like areas of the game that I don't necessarily uh, go into. So it was really cool. But uh, yeah, happy to be here on Sunday. Yeah, this is our crown crowning show. Uh, so we have people from everywhere, like Electus Matari. That is the home of Arcia. How are you doing, Arcia? I'm doing well. Yeah, those shows sound interesting. I have to go watch the spying one. Spying is something I don't think I could ever do, like, like in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, actually, she talked about uh, the uh, the sadness of it, you know, the isolation and stuff. No, you have to, like, go join a group. And when you join a group, you become friends with, like, everybody in the group. And then, like, you're, like, ultimately, like, I'm pretending to be friends with these people to, like, screw them over in, like, half a year. I couldn't do that. Yeah, I think she had a problem with that, too. And she explains how. And it was she was actually loyal to the guys that she was with at Geo uh, in Guardians of the Galaxies, too. So she didn't outright destroy them. She was just passing along information. It's all explained in there because it's very delicate mental gymnastics you have to do not to feel bad. Like, I just make friends with the other side and then straight up ask them, are you attacking us? Like, what are you bringing? <laughs> right. Like, it works way more often than you expect. <laughs> Probably. All right, from Volta, we have Suetonia there in darkness. There you go. <laughs> hey, yeah, my uh, my light broke, so uh, yeah, you have to see me 
dark. I have the, the perfect background for it though, right? You know? The, the yeah, absolutely. Dark blue. Very, very mysterious. Yeah. Um, and also unaffiliated uh, is Caleb up there with his uh, famous whiteboard where his ideas go. How's it going, Caleb? That's going fine. Uh, yeah, I'm a dirty high seeker. And, and, and I would just like to point out that both uh, regarding Elise and, and, and Arceus' comment, that's exactly what a spy would say. Mm. They're better than I thought. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> okay, and our guest today, or our first guest today, is Vili. He is the, one of the commanders of the Pat P forces, which are assaulting Delve. Everybody knows there is a giant war going on there. I'll call it really kind of an end of days war where everything will change after this uh, incredible collision of uh, firepower and people and resources, something that's been saved for five years at least. And uh, so nobody can escape it. It's uh, been at least four regions wide in the active uh, delve area, but also counterattacks in legacy space have left that uh, you know, destroyed as well. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, this year so far in the Delve War with Billy, uh, again, a commander for Pappy Forces from Test Alliance. How are you doing, Billy? Doing well. How are you? Really good. All right, guys, let's, let's actually do a comprehensive review of uh, what's been happening pretty much since the end of the year last year. Uh, I'm just going to give you the themes here, and then we'll go into go into uh, what's happened. But on January, the very beginning of January, like January 2nd, the conclusion of the M2 battle happened, which led to uh, the Pappy forces losing a ton of Titans and being trapped in M2. And uh, on February, uh, at the end of February... Pappy was able, no, in February, Pappy was able to break out, actually escape uh, with a portion, but not all of those, and uh, was able to swing momentum in their favor over the last, over February. That was at the end of January, beginning of February. And now that February is ending, it looks like uh, the iHub that you were able to capture in M2 has matured or is maturing. And so March looks like uh, it's bringing an end to the camp. There's no other way to really hold it, no secure way. So we're coming full circle on this M2 thing. Uh, let's start with you, Billy. Tell us, like, uh, in January, what, what happened and uh, uh, how, how it's uh, affected today, basically, where we're at today. So obviously, uh, the very first few days of January, we had the second part of the M2 battle in which uh, we took a heavy blow. Uh, we basically became the turkeys in a turkey shoot and ended up in a really terrible situation with uh, upwards of 100 Titan Supers, caps, whatever, uh, trapped at the bottom part of the Keepstar, 30 kilometers below it. And now with a second group of Titan Supers uh, from the second battle uh, trapped up top, which was you know, just as large or larger. Uh, and with a large component of that, those ships actually being what we're, we've are we generally termed the ghost ships, where their ship and hull had bounced back into T5Z or not died, but was still alive due to the way the server performance had fallen apart. Uh, so, And that was to the tune of almost 70 Titans. So at, at post M2 battle, uh, we were in a, in a terrible state. Uh, morale was really down and you know, the imp importance of morale just can't be understated in these kind of wars where everyone's a volunteer and nobody has to show up, right? So instantly our fleet participation went down by half, goon fleet participation went up by double, uh, creating a situation where all of a sudden we were outnumbered in every conceivable way. Uh, this created a situation where goons very quickly began to reassert uh, strength in Delve and took back, I think, nine of the 12 uh sov 3 or doom clock keep stars the systems that we had uh, been working on throughout the course of december uh that resulted in you know a little bit of a morale swing for them but they also kind of didn't get necessarily a free pass and you know over the two to three weeks uh while they you know enjoyed their kind of absolute superiority let's say uh, that that's what they accomplished uh, about the three-week mark in January, post M2, uh, things started to swing backwards. Momentum started to shift 
uh, back towards Pappy Forces in kind of a day-by-day -day, uh, event, starting primarily in U.S. time zone, where we were able to leverage capital usage uh, against a number of Goon FCs, despite the fact we had so many trapped, uh, with the Battle of YQX, and then later the Dread Battle in M2, being kind of the highlights of those battles. Uh, at this point, the success in U.S. time zone began translating into the European time zone, where all of a sudden we were able to start holding the line on iHubs as well. And within a matter of three to four weeks, uh, we had basically regained the initiative and regained control of the region. At this point, uh, we took our first stab at the M2 iHub, uh, which was actually, I, I believe the first break was right before that, if I'm wrong. Yes. So throughout this entire period, we had been trying to weaken uh, the defender's ability to maintain the camp. Uh, so we had, you know, done what we generally generally termed as the dinner bell strategy, which is we would run into M2, we would shoot bubbles, uh, force the Imperium to form up quickly uh, to defend their bubbles, and allow us, in most cases, to get a favorable battle favorable battle report as we would, you know, march in, get some kills, and generally try to march out before the numbers turned against us. This was really good at kind of wearing them down, and it allowed us to open up the situation enough that with a well-planned and, you know, very secretive operation, we were able to successfully execute the the major break of M2 when we uh, did a mass login at 0500 uh, with 400 dreads to kind of create a pressure on the enemy Titan groups so that they were not able to just sit there and freely doomsday away at our Titans. Uh, we extracted 180-ish, I believe is the running number, uh, Titans, plus uh, an unknown count of supers and regular carriers, etc. Uh, and this overall led us to uh, being comfortable with our capital situation to begin making even larger plays throughout the region. That is probably like the, the first real big kind of turning back point, even though even as much as a week or two before that event, the momentum had already shifted uh, back towards us. But that uh, enabled us to take a stab at the M2 iHub, which we did when there was seven days left on goons acquiring SOV3 there, uh, which was a really dangerous kind of point for us as it would allow them to sign up jam the system. It would allow them to establish jump bridges, and it would basically mean that for all intents and purposes, it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get out of the M2 camp without excessive losses. Uh, right. So we took the IHUB back uh, 35 days ago, and from then on, because there wasn't really much left to do in M2, uh, we, we, we tested the waters for another breakup, but the general consensus became that the losses we would incur attempting another breakup weren't really worth the, the capital advantage gain we would get from it. So we were already in a position where goons were not comfortable using their supers and caps against us outside of M2. So getting those additional caps back didn't serve any real purpose. And so we just tried to, uh, or we ensured that we could hold the IHEB comfortably. You know, we set it as test capital for the ADM bonus. And then we worked towards SOV3, which we've been doing for the better part of the last 35 days. Uh, obviously, meanwhile, we started a campaign of um, heavy pressure on the Imperium's industrial facilities, so Tios, Sutaras, etc. We killed the one Keep Keepstar as well in there, uh, as it was one of the remaining SOV 3s that uh, we had. And now we're just coming back into the zone where all of our work for the last 35 days that we've been setting up has, is starting to pay its dividends. Wow, that's uh, that's a lot that's happened there. Uh, we'll break it down with the panel in a second. Do you have a link to that Doom Clock? Does anybody? Let me know. If you do, put it in chat. Uh, really, you were expecting this play, right? Which play? Uh, the, the the pulling back right now. I, I, I don't know what I was expecting, honestly. Like, it, it's a very awkward situation to be in. If I was in their position, I probably would have pulled the camp up last week. If I was under the impression I wasn't going to be able to uh, hold it, just because it's a little cleaner than doing it in the last day, and it becomes very obvious the purpose of it. But 
once we hit soft three, once we have that jammer, it, it becomes all but impossible to hold the camp in any reasonable way. Uh, so the, the expectation was they would pull the camp down once we hit soft three. Uh, it, it's just a logical play. All right, let's uh, torture you a little bit and take you back to M2, right? So you have this opportunity. What were you thinking in M2, Billy? At the what final time? Timer. At the final timer. Uh, for the final timer, we were, as kind of I said before, we were hoping to get a, a much more decisive battle. Uh, we were in a position where we knew we were not going to be doing great jumping in, but we made the call to go in, accept some losses for the hope that we would be able to get a decisive battle as the Keepstar died, because once you jump in, the Keepstar is all but certainly going to die. It's very easy to maintain DPS on a Keepstar with Titans. And, you know, we were looking for, for just another M2 Part 1. Uh, obviously, what we got was not that. We, we failed to load, and, you know, as I say, we became the turkeys in a turkey shoot. Well, the, the question is, and this is um, part of, I think, some of the uh, narratives that get spun up afterwards, is, is what were you thinking jumping in 6,000 people or that you had in a staging system into a system that already had 4,500? Like, the servers could never support that. Why would you do that? Why would we do that? No, why would you do that? Because the story is that you did it. Well, I'm certainly one of the people that was at the decision table, but, um, you know, all, every decision at this level of the coalition this size is going to be a group decision. Uh, but we wanted the fight. Uh, we thought that the servers would be rough, but they would hold. Uh, every battle up to this point has shown that, you know, the servers will creak and groan, etc., but th they will hold you through. And, um, just not loading was not what we expected. Um, we jumped in a couple test fleets, uh, not like test lines, but um, testing the waters of the server situation kind of fleets before uh, we jumped in any Titan groups. And uh, they were, for the most part, fine. They loaded very quickly. We, we knew it would be a little rougher with our next group, uh, but we did not anticipate just not loading uh, for hours, right? We, we figured it would be a situation where, you know, it would take us, you know, we actually factors in, you know, it'll take us an hour to load. We'll lose 20 Titans in that time. Um, we just, the, but, yeah, but the limit, the limit was that we'd seen, cause we'd seen a pretty good display of server functionality two days before, but that was only at like 5,500. And it was kind of humming along. So how many people did you actually jump in or intend to jump in over time we intended to jump them all in so you were going to try to squeeze uh, basically get ten thousand people on the same server well is there a server cap or not right there's not so you know you you run under the assumption that you know the server will struggle but it will allow everyone the the, the reality is that there's never been a bat like in the battles of FWST, in the battles of YZ9, everybody that wanted to get in eventually got in. You know, sometimes it took half an hour to an hour to load, but bit by bit, it, uh, you know, everybody got in. So as somebody in a smaller group, um, when I hear about a battle where like 12,000 people, like what's just like, what, like one third of all the active accounts logged on at, at one time are involved in, I honestly think it's kind of dumb, not like that you or Imperium did anything dumb, neither of you did anything dumb. Well, may maybe you both did something dumb, but the point is... Somebody did. The point <laughs> I'm trying to make is the game encourages people to uh, group up in groups this size, and maybe do you think it should do something different to try to spread people out so that like 12,000 people don't try to jump into the same system again? Because if we keep growing the mega groups to a certain point, there's always going to be a certain point where the server doesn't hold, right? I think it would be great if there was, but I've never seen a mechanic proposed that successfully accomplishes that. 
Well, and in Villa's defense, right? You can't. It, it's not really fair that the players uh, have to adapt to some sort of uh, known cap, right? We have to assume that the game works, and otherwise, it just becomes impossible to to strategize and and figure out what to actually do. So we have to assume that things work, and when they don't, we just have to eat that. I will say with um, with regards to the the Pappy decision to come in, right? So it, it's easy to say in hindsight, oh, this was a bad idea. What did you think was going to happen? Um, but really, in the moment. Right. If if you just think about it objectively, they Pappy decided to jump in their forces well above the keep star outside of Doomsday range. Right. So they knew that eventually they would load. And during that time of loading, they would have ample time to not only load, but get into range before the Doomsdays could fire. That was the thought. Um, while they did have six thousand people or so trying to come into system, they could still be competitive with about 1,500 of those in the system, which is what they tried to bring in, right? They didn't try to bring 6,000 people in at once. That is very, very <laughs> bad decisions, right? But that's not what they tried to do. They wanted their Titan fleet. Titan and supers and carriers fleet. were the only things that were coming in originally, right? Exactly, right? So, so carriers to clear the fighters load, and titans to get themselves loaded. Let's clear that up real quick. Sorry, uh, Elise, but how, about how many then were you jumping in? Was it fifteen? He's not. He's not wrong. It's somewhere around the fifteen hundred, two thousand. Uh, okay. All right. So, so, so it's easy to say, like, oh, you, there's forty five hundred people. If you jump in six thousand, you're dumb, right? But they weren't trying to jump in six thousand at the start. Um, and we've seen this before, right? Uh, even in battles like um, in BTAC R, if you want to go all the way back to BTAC R, um, as there were a lot of people outside of the system that wanted to come in, the decision was, hey, we can't bring you all in, so we're only going to focus on the capitals. And the dictators, if you're somewhere else, or if you're in other ships, go do something else outside of BTAC R. So I'd imagine that's probably the type of dynamic that would have happened uh, in M2. There's a ton of uh, subcaps that would say, hey, we don't need to be here. We can do, we can guard gates. We can do other stuff. As people die, or as people have to log off, or as people crash, we'll come in and sneak in. But we don't have to bring everyone in at once. I think the, um, if you want to go full hindsight, right, uh, and, and you're in that Pappy war room, I think the decision you make isn't, let's not jump in. I think the decision you make is, let's jump in at the Fortizar first. Um, even though they chose a position that was sort of safe, it wasn't completely safe. If you jump in at the Fortizar, at least you know that if you crash, you have like that little, that little safety net to tether you there. Right. And I think that all everything you just said there, at least, I think needs to be part of the permanent record, uh, because it makes more sense why a group of very experienced FCs would make the decisions they made. Because otherwise, it just looks like, what were you thinking? Like, why would you do that? But now that makes more sense. Okay, so and what's funny, I think the funniest part of it, not that it was funny for you, Billy, I'm sure it was incredibly painful, but you got the new nickname of Trappy, which was hilarious. But uh, they get to put it in all caps again because they have their caps back. So before it was lowercase because <laughs> they had no caps, now, <laughs> it's, now it's all up. So what are we now, like slappy? Like We slapped them around? Oh. That just makes me think of that squirrel from Animaniacs, the... The old squirrel from Animaniacs who's always, always cranky. <laughs> Slappy the squirrel. What okay. happened to the Anaconda Coalition? Like it seems like they changed their name for your coalition like every two weeks. <laughs> I mean, they were they were doing the Anaconda thing and then they lost all their Titans because they tried to jam six thousand more people into the server and then it didn't have the strangling power anymore. Well, actually, oh, they seem to be strangling them just fine right now. So yeah, we'll get to the anaconda thing because I think we're back there. Elise was astute uh, way back when he uh, coined the term, and Dunk totally embraced it. But okay, so that was M two painful time for you. Uh, how bad was it? Like, take us into Pappy corridors. How bad was that defeat? Were you guys thinking of stopping? Did that ever come up? Yeah, absolutely. Like the when when you lose a a battle like that like it, it's such a an incredible black swan event right where you know it, it's something that will probably never happen in eve again uh it takes it takes a lot out of you right it, it it's absolutely a, a devastating kind of loss and you know you question 
you know, your time investment, you question your strategy, you question all kinds of things. Uh, were, were people pointing at each other saying it was you, it was you Fredo. Honestly, like everybody on the Pappy side, um, knew who had been making what calls and what decisions. And everybody understood that we as a group made those decisions or, you know, let others make those decisions, et cetera. Like nobody was going to be, I, I don't know. It's one of those things that, you know, adversity creates bonds, right? It's always been a truth of human nature. If you go through something difficult together, you become much more comfortable with those people. And certainly, um, M2 didn't break us, and in fact, it, it made those bonds much deeper, much stronger, uh, because we had been through such an incredible component of adversity uh, together. Well, you know, that scales up on de Delve level too, right? Well, I, I, normally when things go wrong, people run away from it, right? They're like, well, that wasn't, that wasn't me. they don't have a choice. Well, there's a lot of secrecy. Like we saw Pro Guide go on to Pando's show and talk about, yeah, it probably wasn't the right decision. But, you know, everybody was there. Nobody said, don't do it. Uh, there's a lot of peer pressure, I suppose, since people had traveled a long way to be a part of this. Really, a lot of people have come back to the game to be a part of this incredible opportunity to have a huge fight. And we saw numbers completely swell and even celebrity players from the past come back to be a part of it. How could you say... We're not going to do it. Uh, I think that was something that ProGuide mentioned. But there's also the uh, like playing into the goon narrative side of it too, right? Because otherwise, uh, if uh, they didn't jump in, Goon Swarm would you know take the whole uh, pass B thing to another level, right? Well, the reality is that because of the way in which the first battle happened, where we ended up with a large component of our forces in M2 underneath the Keepstar trapped from the first battle because we chose not to log back in after downtime. Um, taking this fight had a more favorable natural beginning than if we would have, you know, just started it fresh, if that makes sense. Like the, the equation starts from a position where it's encouraging you to take the fight, I guess you could say. And I will say, just uh, as someone that was in the the first M2, it's just like a, a normie line member guy. The the excitement was real, right? This was the culmination, the final battle that you spent the last three years of your Eve life earning your Titan uh, for a lot of these members, right? Uh, and you finally get that set piece battle that decides the fate of the universe. It feels like, and you're in it. You're fighting your doomsday. You're watching things explode. And at the end of it, uh, this is the first time too, not the second one. At the end of it, you're like, wow, I just punched the biggest guy that's ever stepped into the ring as hard as I could. And I took that punch the same way, but I'm invigorated by it. Let me do it again. And then yeah. you have everything comes to, to fruition like two days later. And you're like, I want to do it again. And now you're like even bigger in your ring, right? So your numbers swell even higher. The enemy numbers swell even higher because they want to get in on it. Just that that feeling after the first M2 was so intoxicating. It, it sort of baits you in. It lures you into this situation where you want to do it again because it was, it was something Eve has never seen before, right? No one's seen a super cap fight that large. No one's seen a fight that bloody where both sides come out thinking that they won. Right? It's this cool, weird situation where it's just it's just begging you to do it again. And so sometimes the the logical part of your brain, like the, the front part, is saying, hey, why don't we be careful? It just the lizard brain is screaming at you like, jump in, just do it, dude. It'll be great. <laughs> I, have so a, I think that plays a role. What could go it. wrong? <laughs> I have a few questions from chat that uh, is addressed at Vili. Uh, uh, it's now on a list of, uh, of three questions from three different people. So I start with the first one. Uh, I can't remember who actually asked this, but um, was there any um, complaints or, or dissenting voices before jumping into the whole M2 thing? Um, and were they silenced or uh, was it just not enough to matter? There wasn't really, like, anytime we make a decision, like, at that scale, you have a long discussion about it. And the discussion went back and forth in a variety of ways but at no point was the discussion you know you know let's not jump in although that was discussed at one point early 
but you know to say it was silenced would be no we just you know everybody was mostly on the same page i guess then the, the the second one is uh why didn't pappy actually lock in uh, after downtime on the first m2 thing uh, considering that it was a uh, fairly even slugfest um people were just tired more than anything uh, wow. I know there were certain people that wanted to log back in, and there was a lot of people that didn't want to log back in. And, you know, after playing EVE for, I think we were at 12 or 15 hours, many people having stayed up throughout the night, um, you know, the, the call, whether it be the right or wrong one, um, was to not log back in. So yeah, I think, it, I think it, the, the media was pretty tired as well from covering it. I, I remember that the, the, the streamers were looking a little bit sluggish, so I can only imagine that... The, the fighters were, were feeling the same. The last question is, um, what about the whole um, Blue Donut thing? Is is that going to, uh, are you going to uh, dissolve that after some sort of win condition? At some point, the Pappy forces will go back to their respective lanes and go do whatever they want to do in their own time. Like, that's always been the, the plan. That's always been the strategy. That's always been the expectation. Um, it, it's... A group this large can't stay together indefinitely. It just doesn't work. Like the the forces we have here are not they're, they're just not built that way. Can you just uh, answer one? This is my own. Uh, okay. It, it feels a little bit like you, you're almost like uh, chest and 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 goons are trying to 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 swap houses or something. Uh, feels like the whole backfield thing and. Uh, well, if they need to move somewhere, they can almost like move into your house because you're not at home anymore. So is this like a chess board where the pawns have reached the opponent's end and you're going to... Like a StarCraft base race or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it, it, it looks a little bit like that, of course, not completely, but it, it feels like you guys are about to go, okay, if we want to have peace on the other side of a, of a bloody nose or a complete uh, bloodbath then saying, okay, you can have our house and, uh, and and we take yours. I think that would be unlikely, but it's certainly a possibility to a degree. All I can um, think of now is if Pylons had reinforcement tankers in StarCraft. Oh, boy. All right, so we went back and we talked about M2, how that collapsed uh, and trapped... Uh, Pappy for a while. It was bleak. People thought like this could be the end. Uh, your momentum was pretty much stopped, and Imperium actually gained momentum, which was an amazing reversal. Uh, what would how or tell us about that period where you guys are recuperating your energy, taking a break, taking a rest? What was the thinking there, and what was going on around you at the time? In the the three weeks post M two, where yeah, break. yeah. So, I mean, it's a situation where, you know, it's it's a struggle to get people to log in. Everybody's concerned about their Super and Titan guys. We're still formulating a plan on how to get them out. You know, there's no clear strategy. And Imperium's pushing every timer with, you know, double the normals, they, numbers they normally have, right? So they start hitting iHubs, and they're forming three, four, five full fleets, and we're struggling to get, like, two, three. So, it, you know, it creates this dynamic where you're very far behind on the numbers. Your guys are just not interested that day you know they, they just we gave you a ton this, of their time so. yeah let's make this clear because i didn't unless you looked at the ghost titan numbers really the people who were hurt the most in uh the m2 trap were um not not the people that were there logged off from the armor timer right but the people that were hurt were test and brave it looked like it looked like nc only had a couple titans that were lost so the the way the the server bounced back and Ghost Titan mechanics ended up working, um, it it validated tests load requests first. So our Titan fleet went through the Sino, uh, appeared in front of the Imperium, and obviously never loaded. Uh, well, in you know many of the other uh, <laughs> fleets, uh, like in hordes like Supercarrier fleet, I think uh, was much the same. That their load requests went in, and some of their Titans obviously. Uh, but very few of the NCPL ones, like their load request, I guess, got put second half of the queue. Like nobody knows how it all works, right? We we just you know theorize and guess. Uh, like, but what what happened is our our load requests went in, and you know the, we we appeared as the buffet. So yeah, what a gift, right? I mean, you're the target, and they put and the server put you right up front. 
uh, to be massacred, and all the rest of Pappy were coming in later and maybe ne never even showed up. On well, the here. majority of them never did show up, right? It's, yeah. It just, they got server bounce backed. Yeah, what an absolute gift uh, to the Imperium. So when, and the reason I bring that up is because as you're reconstituting and, you know, uh, people are demoralized and stuff, that's hitting you pretty hard as opposed to maybe NC dot. It looks like NC dot makes a quicker recovery. And I wonder if that had something to do with it. Probably had a little bit of a do with it, yeah. Like you got to remember, usually your Titan pilots and your super carrier pilots are some of your more committed pilots, right? You're the, they're the guys with three, four, five accounts. They're the guys who usually uh, do a ton of the industry stuff, do a ton of, you know, all, all of those things in the background that help your alliance run, right? They're, they're your corp leaders, your corp directors, your CEOs. You know, as much as they're your Titan pilots, they're also in many ways the heart of your alliance in many cases. All right, do you think, uh, I'll just ask it this way, from your perspective, and it is your perspective, did Imperium make the most out of having you trapped? No, absolutely not. Uh, we, we, we've had this discussion many times, but there were very clear and obvious targets that they could have taken advantage of, you know, their numer numerical advantages of the time with. Uh, there's ways they could have seized the initiative and began. Uh, pushing hard at us and forcing us to make real tough decisions very quickly. Uh, but they didn't. Um, and I, I think that's, although, you know, we're looking back in hindsight, what could they have done? But the reality is you're still in a situation where the Imperium was just realizing that it had this ad advantage to play with at the time. And they had been on such a defensive reactionary back foot for so long that it takes a while to get yourself moving off of that stance right like to go from the defensive to the offensive is not something that people usually like snap their fingers and do right it takes a little bit of mental adjustment to to make that switch and if they had made that switch i i feel like they could have got a ton done but they they obviously didn't and you know they got some ihubs and they reset some progress and it was good for them but you know the, the, there's what, just what would you have done in a perfect world, hindsight 2020, uh, I would have instantly hit the YZ9 Keepster. Something bold. Well, I don't even know if that, like, bold would have hit T5Z, but, like, there, there's a ton of different things they could have done. They could have started dropping Fortizars in T5Z, for example. Um, they could have instantly hit YZ9, started threatening our, you know, Keepster connection chain so that, you know, all our supply routes are, you know, at risk, you know, create a possible scenario where we want to retreat out of T5Z. There's a ton of different ways they could have played it, but all of that is hindsight, right? And it's unfair to, you know, expect someone to shift on a dime like that. Yeah, well, at least what would you have done? <laughs> what would at least do? I mean, I think Billy is kind of right here, right? So if, um, if you think you're in this massive advantageous position, what you do is you want to trap your enemy in with you. Hitting the YZ9 Keepstar is, is that that's what accomplishes it, right? So you cannot leave. Um, that's part of your you cannot safely leave, I should say, um, because that's part of your your route out of here. Uh, so it really sends the message uh, that you're stuck here with us. But what they did accomplish is it's kind of impressive, right? So the the, um, the dismantling of the M2 TAC. Uh, Hell Camp, which is something we're going to touch on a little bit later, um, it's going to be viewed very differently by both both sides, and it's going to be viewed positively by their respective sides. So to to give a little bit of uh, objectivity to this, right? So what Imperium accomplished, they started with the initiative. They started torching Catch, so they forced Brave and other groups that lived in Catch to relocate. Uh, they got a lot of swagger that way. They manned a hell camp for two months, which is something that EVE Online really hasn't done before. Uh, it, it's it's an impressive feat, if you want to think about it, being able to put like that level of effort onto it. Um, they got 400 dread kills, which is something that's that's not insignificant, right? Those 400 dreads um, were used to, to do the first breakout attempt, I guess, or the first successful breakout attempt. Uh, they killed a few dozen supers and, and titans, which is cool. They killed a bunch of capitals, which is cool. Um, and they got to leverage like M2 as their like 
their swagger monument, I guess we could call it, or their smug monument. So anything that happened, they could be like, got your supers. Uh, and you saw like the narrative really shifted to, uh, we trapped you here. You guys are stuck. We're going to refer to you as uh, as Pappy with no caps. So it's all lowercase because you lost everything. Uh, <laughs> you guys, you're, you're foolish. Your FCs are dumb. Uh, and so it really built up the Imperium at the expense uh, of Pappy for, for quite some time. I think Vili is right that eventually that did peter out a little bit, but the only part that petered out was Pappy's like demotivation. Uh, it still kept the Imperium motivated the entire time, like that. It never really fizzled out for them. They still booned in numbers. They they went up. Um, you're you're seeing Titan numbers and Titan pilots that were active six years ago before suddenly active in the Imperium now, which I think took a lot of people by surprise. Um, you bolstered your, your Titan numbers tremendously on the Imperium side, and they were already quite high. Um, so I, I don't know. I think they were pretty effective with what they did. Um, if we have, like, a genie and a magic lamp, I think you probably dismantle the M2 Hell Camp a little bit sooner. Um, because after that first breakout attempt where you got the 400 dreads, I think that's kind of the perfect spot to say... Got your 400 dread suckers, and now we're going home. Ha, 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 you lost everything. Because what they traded for that, in Delve at least, is the area that, that was formerly Helm's Deep, right? All those areas that had so much industry, uh, so much ratting, stuff like that. Um, and, and, but outside of Delve, they got catch, which is nice. So they forced uh, people into, they forced primarily Legacy, the Brave parts, uh, into Quirius. So they kind of really made them feel like they were at war. And the narrative really does shift to, we don't care about Panda Fam anymore. Um, we really want to focus on the legacy side, right? So they, after M2 the first time, the focus is, you know what? We're going after test hard as we can. Everything we do is meant to disparage test members, right? Not even all legacy members, just test members specifically. Um, and, and that's kind of where we are right now. Hmm. Well, that's a good that's a good uh, analysis there. By the way, we didn't uh, invite Asher Elias FC from the Imperium and uh, Mr. V uh, also FC from Imperium. Uh, neither one of us got neither one of them got back to us. So, uh, so we're continuing with Vili and the uh, Pappy side basically of what is going on now in M two or now that M two is uh, is officially over. So they take the war to legacy space. Uh, they look for opportunities to create discord inside of legacy itself. That's their enemy. It's the one that was served up in M2. They have you trapped, but you do manage to break out uh, some titans at a huge cost of uh, many, many, many dreads, many dreads. Uh, but you definitely got more out than uh, way more than the dreads that you lost. So what is going what is going on in your strategic mind about M2? Is it a net plus or a net minus for Imperium? Do you see it as an opportunity to take advantage of, well, let's just go through the rest of this uh, delve and take as much as we can? You know, tell us about Helm's Deep and, and that whole thing. Myself? Yeah, if you're still there. Yeah, yeah. Um... So post breakout, uh, post the major breakout, we were definitely in a position where we we basically hand shook the agreement. We said, OK, you want to camp us in? We're OK with that. We're not going to really too, put too much focus on breaking out. We're going, you know, we have the eye up now. We're going to focus on making you pay extensively for this hell camp. And obviously we did a test run on the Helm's Deep area the week before we took it. And, you know, Imperium formed a pretty big to defend it. Uh, and then the following week we did it again and we were able to, you know, get uh, two bricks out of the wall, which opens up the Sinojammer wall, which means the whole thing is basically um, vulnerable. And to us, Helm's Deep had been a, a very uh, serious target that we'd been looking at with very significant implications for um, everything around it, right? It, it represented kind of the last refuge of Imperium safe space. It, it had a ton of industry still going. It had a ton of reactions going. It had a ton of, ra you know, just everything a, a member wants to do in your space, right? Yet I understand it was cloaky camped and it wasn't perfect, but uh, that kind of space allows people to mentally 
not feel like they're under siege, right? It's the paradise inside, you know, the war zone. So for us, breaking down Helm's Deep was a, was a really critical target that we had been trying to, you know, find a way into uh, for a while. And, 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 and the Helm's Deep camp uh, area itself had been uh, basically our primary goal right before M2 uh, had kind of reset a lot of our stuff. So, you know, we saw the opportunity uh, and we were we were OK with this situation. You know, the Imperium is spending, you know, thousands and thousands of man hours every day camp, you know, camping this 30 uh, percent of the Titans that were originally, camp, you know, trapped there. Um, they, they put themselves in a static position. You know, it, it helps burn out their FCs and their members. Uh, we were just perfectly OK with it. So we seized the opportunity. Uh, we marched on, you know, Helm's Deep. We took basically every IHUB in the region. and you know we were just like all right if you guys want to play it this way we'll we'll play it this way too this works for us and, and we were super super okay with the situation as it was i mean it wasn't ideal for the pilots that were still stuck obviously uh but there wasn't a, a reasonable or comfortable way for us to extract them from the camp uh the, the camp as it was built it, it is built on this like I was describing this to someone else. It's, it's like a hard closed door, right? For us to get in there, we've really got to like bust down that door and get in. Like, a, a versus a, 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 a better camp probably would have been one where the door is at least partway open. So we we try to get you know some dudes out, and maybe we get ten dudes out, but we lose two or three in the process because basically every time we attempted to extract people from the M2 camp, we lost a couple. Uh, and that would have required a lot less effort to maintain, but also been much more likely to achieve kills. So regardless of how, uh, you know, you, you want to like theorize the camp should have been run the way they ran it is the way you ran it. And we were okay with that. Well, since you, since you keep uh, going on, on the Lord of the Rings, uh, thing, I, I just have one question because it looked like now that, uh, you've pretty much almost finished, uh, Osculias, um, the white city is next, right? And 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 not burning the farms and fields of the Rohan, right? So 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 when one DQ or rather, what is the plan now? Uh, we're going to take some time to consolidate our uh, victories around Delve. We're going to make sure that we are in a position where the numerous uh, runs up the one DQ ladders uh, are going to be uh, backended by you know, alliance and coalition that lives in Delve to a certain degree. So you're going to extract a little bit more pain before the big final. But how do you feel about that one? We're, we're, we're going to we're, we're going to work on purging the 29 Keepstars we have under Sov three Ahibs, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I've seen the list. Yeah. So you know, we're we're gonna like one one AQ is 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 the big one right it's the it's the last it's the final stand it's the last stand of the imperium and so, so we're gonna you know take our time we're gonna build our siege engines we're going to you know make sure the area surrounding uh the one dq constellation is nice and uh cleared and you know it's rebuilt with you know proper legacy structures instead and so you know as we do run one and two and three and four and five at one dq uh, if anything goes wrong, we're not in a position where we're on the back foot. Uh, so if the server crapped itself for them to, how, how do you think it would handle 1DQ? Isn't that going to probably end up being bigger? No, not really. Um, the thing about 1DQ is it's a slow progression in all likelihood, right? So the question number one is, do you think you can hold every IHUB in the 1DQ constellation? And obviously the answer is, or should be no, I would think, for most Imperium members. You know, can we hold all the, you know, IHUBs in that constellation? I would think they, there's almost zero chance they can. And then the question becomes, you know, can you, or if you want to even go one step further back, do you think that we, you can prevent us from anchoring a structure in every system in the 1DQ constellation? So, you know, will we build structure spam, stru structure spam up structures in every system in the constellation? And I think what, a reasonable person will say yes. Can we then take every system in the 1DQ constellation except for 1DQ? A reasonable person is going to say yes. Can we then structure spam 1DQ itself? I think a reasonable person is going to say, yes, you're going to be able to get a structure online in 1DQ. Can we then begin to harass and make 1DQ itself like a, a wasteland to a degree? And I think a reasonable person says yes. And the question is, can you defend the Tatara in 1DQ? And I think a reasonable person says, probably not. Tataras are not exactly super 
um, defensible? Can you defend a single faction for Desert and Windy Q? Can you defend the I have a Windy Q? Because if you lose the I have a Windy Q, obviously, um, you know, the I have is going to be lost if it gets reinforced even a single time. And each of those timers, each of those opportunities, there is going to be times where the Imperium can do an all hands on deck CTA, etc. But we can just say, okay, they've manned the walls, we'll do it again tomorrow. Right? And, and you can you can effectively um, choke out their ability to have that true master fight that they're looking for, right? And if the server is not going to be with us, then we'll just, you know, win it the other way, which is the slow, you know, inevitable kind of oh, so it's, dance yeah, of so death. you're doing the, uh, like the, they have good numbers, let's blue ball and come back again. Well, if the server can't know. handle it, what other choice do I have, right? But isn't that potential scenario going to take way too long to be realistic? Way too long to be realistic in what's in what world? Like what well, what timeline what time clock are we on? Aren't you well, guys gonna get bored of winning? Well or, or or sitting there staring at the people in there that's not doing anything, or maybe they're just playing all, all their alts. And... All, all all the happy members have home space, they can go rat and mine and do whatever they want on when they're not doing stuff. Yeah, but you're you're locking down some sort of stalemate that never concludes, and that means that oh, it'll conclude. Like as I say, like we will find a hole. We always do. We'll we'll, fi we'll find the the brick in the in the wall that is not firmly planted, and we'll per and we'll just pour through. Like if you truly believe that the one DQ wall cannot be, you know, broken, then, then every other you know, guard point that the Imperium has said, you know, you know, we won't lose Fountain, we won't lose Quarius, they won't get a keeps our NPC delve, they won't, you know, do this, they won't do that. We've always found a way to do it, and I have no doubt at all that we will find uh, a brick to that is a little bit weak in the one to queue wall and we will fucking pour through. But just like that, every other time. Isn't that mostly okay, everything else you said I agree with. That that would eventually happen. But in this case, this is not a war problem. It's a mechanics problem. I, I don't I've not heard a single person explain how one DQ can actually fall without them actually quitting it. And and again, they're okay, not, once again, I, I will tell you, it, it, it is not possible to form five thousand people every day. The Imperium can form fifteen hundred people daily. Maybe, maybe, and at the fifteen hundred versus two thousand range, the server doesn't struggle with that. Like that's just the honest truth, right? Like yeah, they can do five thousand people every once in a while when it's a big timer, and we can just go, okay, peace out. So you know. at least th this is maybe not what you were thinking when you're like like an anaconda they're going to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and brick by brick the wall's going to like you know brick popping out of brick popping out the wall starts to get weak and fall this isn't what you had in mind is it or is this kind of what you thought was going to happen i mean it sort of is right so the idea of the the anaconda strategy which isn't me making a, a reference to sir mix a lot it's actually the civil <laughs> war strategy okay I, i've read your discord messages where people think i'm talking about sir mix a lot I'm not, although that is very fun to th think about. And I would be lying if I said I didn't think of a song with Billy's Anaconda <laughs> in it. But so you kind of you you strangle your enemy and deplete them of of resources, deplete them in this in this case, you deplete them in fu of fun, uh, you deplete them as op from options, and you make them, you know, you ring the bell as we've seen uh, Pappy do in M2. Uh, the numbers are high. You don't do anything. You just keep doing it until the numbers are where you want while you're managing your own morale, which is a very hard thing to do, but something that Pappy and Imperium have both been very successful in. Um, so it's it's very tricky. So Vili has, has gone through his exact plans for how Pappy see this war, which is pretty insane when you have like an enemy fleet commander and an enemy like war dude saying, hi, enemy, here's what we're going to do to you. Right, so I think the Imperium have been a little bit more cagey, as in how they they view their win conditions. Um, but but lately, it's been a little bit illuminating, right? And uh, since we don't have an Imperium person here to to say their piece, I'm going to take that that position right. a little bit. And I might be <laughs> wrong, right? And I, and I'm very sorry if I if I get it wrong. Uh, but but to do it properly, I have to do a, a little bit of a story, and so I'm very sorry about that too. When I was in college, 
my advisor told me, okay, Peter, who cares about your grades? Or okay, Elise, they didn't call me Elise, but <laughs> they said, who cares about your grades? You have to do other stuff, extracurriculars. So it's like, all right, sounds good. Uh, and I took up fencing. I tried to take up fencing. Uh, and in the fencing class, they told me about a, a famous Russian fencer. I also don't know if this story is true. It's just a story they told me. Um, and they said his strategy was to use a saber, which is you know one of the, the sturdiest uh, weapons you can use in fencing. And what he would do is he would wind up, as the match started, he would wind up and hit his opponent across the chest as hard as he could. It would leave a bruise. It would really sting. Uh, obviously, that's not a legal move in fencing. So he would get a penalty, right? Uh, but he didn't care. That was part of his strategy. The next time, like during the fight itself, if he went like this, his opponent would flinch, even if it's just a microsecond. And with that flinch, he'd use that to his advantage and re-up uh, re the, the points that he lost with uh, the illegal move he did. And he got a reputation for this. He got a reputation for this so much that the International Fencing Organization had to change how they punish that strike across the chest. Um, you know, just uh, because it was it was kind of cheating, right? Um, and it, it kind of felt like it went against the spirit of the rules. So when we're talking about the M2 Hell Camp, uh, it's easy for me to sit here and say, oh, uh, they kept it up too long uh, or they traded too much for it, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I think the Imperium views this as hitting your enemy across the chest with the saber. Uh, if you, essentially the message they're sending is if you make a mistake, we are keeping you trapped um, and you're not going to be able to play the game the, want, the way you want to. All the hard work that you did for the previous months is going to go out the window and, you know, we can just sit back and wait for you to screw up. So what they're hoping for is for the next Keepstar timers or the next big timers that someone is going to flinch. Uh, and now that they've, they've turned their eye, their all-seeing eye, onto uh, the legacy contingent of Pappy, you know, you can, you can see this message in clear as day. You know, the Matani goes on the meta show and says, PL is going to be fine, NC Dot's going to be fine, Horde's going to be fine. That, that telegraphs exactly who they're going after. So they're hoping at some point that legacy is going to break or that legacy is going to flinch and then they will be able to capitalize on that and then that drives their narrative for another few months. right? So, so that's their strategy. So we talk about how uh, Pappy, or at least Vili talks about how Pappy want to do this. Um, the pressure really is on to make sure that they can keep up the momentum, uh, that they can keep their members motivated. And the Imperium is betting that that's not going to happen, right? That's, that's the Imperium's win condition, and they feel very confident about that. I'm not saying that they're right. I'm saying that they feel very confident about it. Um, and, and so that's what they want to do. They want Legacy to flinch. They want Brave to get disinterested. disinterested. They want Severance to say, eh, the last time we did this, we lost a bunch of Titans. Maybe I'll wait for the second fleet to jump in. They want the pilots to have this lingering doubt in the back of their mind that they're going to get hurt when they go on to the next fight. Um, and that's how that's how the Imperium is going to win. That is their, their path to victory here, is to make Pappy break up before they can achieve their goals. And this is why it comes back to what Vili himself said with the whole managing uh, the whole fatigue and morale, right? And and if this draws out and then playing this whole, I, I call it a game of grenades, right? Where it's like, okay, is, is there a surprise in this keep star? No. What about this one? No. What about this one? No. At some point, it might not be a dud. And if, if that ends up being a catastrophe and, and demoralizing in any way, even just a little bit, and it's taken a long time, I think that's just that's I I almost wanted the Admiral Aqua picture because I feel like I feel like uh, the Imperium is is kind of trying to create a trap scenario. But again, uh, opsec and I'm I'm not uh, supposed to uh, divulge things. It's just every time I've mentioned these things and numbers from the past and and what I know about goon culture, I just get laughed at by Billy, and that's fine. It's just I feel like. It's Aww. not going to end in the Billy, way that he suspects. The thing is, and this is important to note, the, this type of war we haven't seen 
members and leaders, or rather leaders, able to keep their members motivated for this long, right? Any event that happens, both sides claim a victory for it. We're talking about dismantling the M2 Hell Camp. Imperium is going to call that a victory because they've uh, kept their enemy trapped for two months, which is longer than anyone's ever manned a Hell Camp before. They've been incredibly successful. They got a bunch of dreads out of it. And they'll just look at, oh, look at what we did in catch. Meanwhile, Pappy is going to say, you guys squandered an opportunity. You stayed there too long. We took Helm's Deep from you. You've got one constellation left. right? They both take the facts, and because of you know what they've delivered to their members, they just show this to the members, say, hey, guys, the plan is working. And both sides are able to do this and not lie, right? They're, they're keeping, um, well, they're managing expectations incredibly well, which is something we've never seen before. At least the, there's a track record now, though. I mean, it seems to me that what is happening in this war from the beginning has been resist what appears to be inevitable, like the keep stars being dropped. They were, uh, the Imperium was defending against those viciously and losing a ton of stuff, and they ended up one day, just not being able to defend, and all that work went down the drain. And M2, a lot of uh, work went into that M2 every day. It was a big party. They tried to um, make it fun, and it was moving towards the inevitable, and now all that work was for nothing. Like, it, it seems like they're holding things off, and that's impressive, but at the end of of a certain period, it just collapses. And then, so it seems to me there's a track record of resistance is futile. What is the uh, victory condition or end condition for this war? Um, so like at what point would one side or, like I, I assume Imperium's victory condition would be the Poppy Coalition falls apart and stops attacking. What would Poppy's victory condition be? Like at what point do you say, We've won, and is the campaign over? The annihilation of Goonstorm, right? That's that's but, what it says. Like, it how can but how can you define victory based on whether like Goonstorm, like they could just move to the Bleaklands and live there, and they still exist, and then you just go go after them forever, like? Um, I, I mean, in in all reality, the victory condition for Pappy is whenever the people in charge think they've won. Like there, there is no, you know, written on a stone, you know, goal that, you know, everybody has kind of signed off on. Uh, we, we have rough goals. We have, you know, parts of goals, but the reality is we're done when we think we're done. And, you know, because of the way, you know, the Imperium has interacted throughout this war, it, it's hard to say when that moment is exactly going to be, honestly. But, but the problem is that that doesn't work, right? Because if, if, if in any of these scenarios, if you extract from Delve and, uh, well, let's say half of the Imperium is left and come back to rebuild. They're going to spin that as a win. So at least one. They're going to spin whatever we do as a win. They, well, they, they could, I, I've seen them spin literally fleet battles where they've lost like fifty build a one as wins because you know they reinforced the jump bridge that didn't go anywhere. It's like saying that like they're going to spin it. It's like I don't care what they spin. I, I just care about reality, right? Like I care about you know the, what's important <laughs> for my guys, like. You know, they they can say that, you know, they've won in a number of ways, but the, the reality is what they say doesn't affect anything when it comes to our decision, you know, uh, profile. No, That's but a again, quote, quote uh, for our times there. But again, the people that are not necessarily Papi and, and uh, the people that write the history books will at least say, well, if you didn't dislodge them and remove them from their homeland, you can't really call a win unless you have like cut them down to size that is ridiculously low, and that doesn't look like it's going to happen because. Well, so, so do I, you think that goons didn't lose World War B one? I'd say that they were very close to losing, and just when the <laughs> okay, win, but well, I'm just sorry. when the win was about to be there, then it ended, and they came back in even better force than they had been. That's just a fact. That's in the history books. <laughs> sure. Like, I, I I can't argue with that. Like, you know, if you're going to view it a certain way, there, there's no way, like, t to be like, yeah, they, they totally didn't lose that war. Like, despite, you know, everybody and their mother 100% agreeing, like, you know, a year ago that they lost the war. Right? Now it's like, well, did they really lose the war? Because they kind of rebuilt after. It's like, 
yeah, we could have killed them like a little more truly or a little more vigorously at the end, but yeah, I don't know, right? Well, don't you know, uh, Kings actually lost BTAC R because PL re rebuilt the supers afterwards, so yeah, yeah, I know exactly, <laughs> right? Like, PL won that war because afterwards Goon let them out, and uh, like you can spin anything whatever way you want, right? But the reality is always very clear to you know most casual observers. All right, so no win condition until you say we're done is basically what you're saying. You're putting no finish line on this. It's a good way to put it, I guess. I don't know. I would say that most people in Pappy would view 1DQ falling as a pretty good victory condition, right? So uh, I'm not saying that's, that's what everyone thinks, right? Uh, yep. But I would say if 1DQ falls, big if, and goons are forced to leave it, either to NPC Delve or somewhere else, that would be a win, right? Uh, the the idea of goons quitting the game, which uh, I think Pro God probably gets slapped around rightfully so for saying, um, I, that's not going to happen. And I don't think anyone expects that to happen realistically. And I don't think anyone wants that to happen realistically, Right. Uh, when you when you end the bad guy, then or when you like kick the bad guy out, then there's no other bad guy, and your your purpose for existing is gone. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say for for most Pappy pilots, the line members, uh, junior FCs, people who do a lot of logistics, people who have done a lot of hard work through this war, they would see the win condition as one DQ falling. Well, okay, so. Well, this is a little bit of a rabbit hole, at least, but I do want to discuss it with you. Uh, one can, of the can things. I, can I say one thing before? We, All right, everyone ahead. was laughing at me uh, like like silly people. If I was a goon hater and I really wanted goon out of the games, uh, right, and, and and not be part of Eve Online anymore, right, which was a criterion in the Casino War, then I can't claim a victory of that war because they came back even stronger. So I would be very frustrated that the the criterion and that the war in Casino War was not finished, right? Because because they're still here and stronger. Then I haven't won at all, and it's the same situation now. If if, if they're not pushed back so far that 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 they're not going to be able to come back stronger, which is very likely if they don't finish the job, it's going to be the same thing. If I'm a goon hater. I'm going to feel like I really didn't win. You're setting up a win condition that can't be accomplished. Nobody in their right mind thinks, oh, we're going to purge them down to zero members. Like, it's just not a reality of EVE. Like, Did anyone not... sound clip that one? Well, I mean, uh, why was that said then by Pro God? Because, like, I assume that maybe it's, like, some kind of psyop to, like, try and freak the Matani out to, like bring back memories of Band of Brothers or something? So this is what, you know, some Molly said. Rhetorical stupidity. Like, you know, you say stuff to sound like, I don't know how to say it, right? But like nobody, th there's no reasonable way to accomplish that goal in a game where so much is out of game, right? Like, it's just not, like, so every time that, that argument is used, it's like, sure, you know, yes, we oh. will not be able to kill them. We all know this, like, but you can damage them. Like, don't get me wrong. Everybody understands, like, that that's what you can do. Uh, but, like, exterminating a group or, like, destroying a group is it, just not a possible thing in this game. Maybe I'm the only one that kind of disagrees with this, but I've seen groups crushed out of existence. Uh, so, like, it, it's a group definitely can a, fall a apart. Thing. A group can fall apart, but, like, you can't make them fall apart. Like, they have to fall Correct. apart on their own. Matter you, can apply, you can apply enough mm -hmm. external pressure to create internal pressure which will cause internal collapse but the, the the internal collapse component is you know it's a coin flip right it, it's not something you can reliably do in most cases i will say one thing right so uh if you've played eve for a, a long time player right so something like six seven years you have not seen the matani at full power Right, like he has not gone super Matani level. As, Are you as saying this isn't even his final form? This is exactly. not even Matani's final form, exactly. Right, there is, he, is no he, way. Is he gonna going to be a Pokemon get, that evolves? <laughs> yeah, sorry. There's no way you're going to get an alliance or a coalition run by the Matani to fail Cascade. Um, he is too experienced, he's too good at what he does, uh, he is too good a handle on his members, um, to allow that to happen. Right, you've seen alliances collapse. Um, 
famously, even big ones. You've seen a DRF fail cascade. You've seen Atlas fail cascade. Uh, you've seen every alliance under the sun that's that's come and gone fail cascade. But the re- like those alliances aren't around anymore for a reason, right? They they've withstood the test of time. The ones that are now out now aren't you like you can't expect that to happen. You can't hope that's going to happen. Um, that's it's just, just a bonus. Not realistic. It, it's it's just not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Like the, yeah. the alliances that are going to die because of that have already died, <laughs> and they've now like coalesced at the top. Right? There's a reason. NC Dot has Vince Strachan, who's been around forever. Uh, there's a reason Horde has Gobbins, who's been around forever. The reason PL has Headliner, who's been around forever and seen it all, and he knows the tricks. Uh, Test has Vili. Like, these guys have been around since the dawn of time. They don't let these mistakes happen anymore. The ones that did have but, already gone and passed. I got gotcha, you, but this is bigger than any war we've ever seen. Like, this well, honestly, is. Honestly, it reminds me of five years. War. It's no yeah. clear end goal and it just keeps going. Like, well, losing. I mean, you can't okay. kill an alliance that has the, a culture like Goonsome, right? Like, take a look at an alliance like CVA, right? They don't necessarily exist because they have great space or something. They exist because they want to uh, do their NRDS thing in Providence. I don't think they're doing that now, so maybe it's a well, bad example. Well, they're that, That's not true either, right? Any alliance in this game can be killed. Like, let me be clear on that. But the expectation should never be that you can actually be the one to do it. Like, you can apply pressure after pressure after pressure after pressure and push them towards that goal, but you can never walk them across the finish line, right? If that makes sense. You know, you could take their space, you can, you know, chase them around, you can uh, harass their members, you know, and camp their members. And like, you, you can do all the things that make it unfun to be in that alliance, but you can never break an alliance, truly. Uh, but you can, anything in this game is possible and no alliance is invincible it is, is the, the point I'm trying to say, but like, like people are like, oh, you know, goons have this culture. Like, yeah, they do. And goon culture is stronger than probably any alliance in this game's culture. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're invincible either, right? It, it, it's a it's a nuance that gets missed. Yeah, I think I'm alone in this, uh, and you guys are all much smarter than me. But I feel like you can you can diminish a group so much so that you take away their actual identity. Like I, I actually think you could do that. You change the circumstances of their existence. There's a lot of doubt that creeps in. And hey, there's a lot of good video games out there. We don't want anybody to leave the game at all for any reason, because Eve is best populated with a lot of people. Uh, but there's a lot of people who this could be a career cap, not only on Goonswarm's side, if Goonswarm loses, or Imperium side, uh, but uh, people who, let's say the Imperium actually wins, it might be a good time to say, like, we did it. We own this game. We're out. You know, like, it's but, but again, conclusions he, he... to war sometimes lead people to retire. But again, even though uh, chat has got the, the World War II history all wrong and it's more like the difference from World War One to World War II, the, 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 the narrative is the same. If the casino war it was an existential loss, right? And I'm, I'm inclined to say that that is fa- factually true. I, I would almost say that they were down to like, what, 20% of, of, of their original size? And that was an existential threat. They were very close to... Uh, being incapable of rebuilding, at least in, in any realistic time frame. So I'm just asking Vili, do you think that's where you are now? Do you think you are capable with this force to take it down to that level? Because we saw that they rebuilt from that. If you take them down to 10, to 10%, are they, are they going to disappear? Or if it's 20%, are they not going to be able to rebuild? Especially if CCP starts fixing the game in, in, in new directions where it becomes a new normal and where everyone is fatigued and we have almost like an EVE 2.0 or a big reset. Do you really think that, that the Imperium is going to be weaker in that scenario? Because I'm inclined to say they're actually going to be stronger. Do I think the Imperium is going to be weaker at the end of this war, if they lose. Yes, exactly. D- 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 yes, I think they will be the, weaker. But compared to the casino war and, and the fact that they came back and, and became even more dominant than they had ever been before, then the scenario on the other end of this war is going to be even more in their favor. This is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. When that blue donut eventually cracks, right, the scenario of the people that, that remains in my opinion, it's going to be the people that can actually play EVE and then a few groups that, in my opinion, they they can't, right? Because they're not like yourself 
or Elise or Vince or all the people that just got mentioned, right? Because they're the real people. And, and I'm seeing the Imperium coming back even stronger, which was not really the point. So all the Gurgoon haters are going to be really sad. You think the Imperium is going to come back stronger than they were pre this war? Like a force ghost. Like, yes, let's be clear here. Like, at the start of this war, there's not much stronger an alliance can be in EVE. Like, think about the massive amount of forces it's taken from all over this game just to equalize the playing field on Titans and Supers and, you know, giving a, us a subcapital advantage. Like, are you telling me that you think they're going to be even stronger after they've been evicted? Yeah, I am. If if the if the conditions and the cost, if the butcher's bill is too high, then yes, they're going to come out stronger because they're not starting from from the same level as everyone else. Can we get a date on when we can measure that, uh, Caleb, from you, so we can look back? On no, this let, let's be clear here. At the end of the war, if we push out goons at a one to queue, and they go move somewhere else, and they start setting up shop again. Anything is possible. They could get stronger. I just find that highly, highly unlikely. I think you've got massive amounts of people in the Imperium right now who are there because of loyalty more than anything, not necessarily because they feel that that's um, their destined place to be. But it's important to remember, if a, a component of what started this war more than anything was the Imperium's own strength and the, the necessity to bring the game together to defeat them, their inability to be matched by anyone else on any other reasonable field, right? And if they if they want to go larger, it's only going to further further stress and create that problem, which will invariably end up with more people coming together to drag them down off the hill, right? When you play King of the Hill, all the little kids will team up to beat you down, right? Like, And if they want to grow bigger, there's just going to be more little kids sooner or later, right? Yeah, but again, of course, uh, chat is again laughing at me and and stop reading chat. Stop, stop reading chat. The, <laughs> and and the point I'm making is that you of all people know about goon culture, and I feel like this is a little bit to me Bing. like a, a seasonal reset in in Diablo. The the really really good guys are always going to be way ahead after a, a seasonal reset, and this is what I'm saying is is what I suspect is going to happen because the, I'm not dude, the pro raiders, the, the the people who like know all the mechanics and know all that shit, they're always ahead. They they don't need like but the reality is the imperium in delve has built up or had built up this incredible industrial base you know 50 keep stars you know 100 sodios like all of this is enabling infrastructure and we're burning that down and it will never be rebuilt again like that the game mechanics just won't allow it right there is never going to be a period of abundance or I hope there is never going to be a period of abundance like the game had between 2016 and 2019, because it's very clear how game breaking that was. And we as a coalition and as a game are working towards fixing that imbalance by burning down those SOTOs, by burning down every rig that's been produced, by destroying those mineral stockpiles, by just bringing death and destruction to, the, to Delve, where this abundance was more in effect than any results in the game. And, and again, I, I'm going to ask for Elise to maybe uh, come in and, 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 and <laughs> point team. out whether or not uh, I am completely ridiculous. But as I see it, the goons can actually be taken down to almost zero assets. And the fact that they have the culture they do, and, and if you're not getting the what I would call the, the, the hundred uh, core people in, in the Imperium to dismantle and, and go their own ways or go back to do adulting in real life, you haven't done anything. You're, you're, just, you're just pushing them down to a server reset or uh, a seasonal reset, and they're going to build exactly the same thing back, even stronger. You're seeing them talk about a cultural revolution 3.0, and they're doing that, right? And I'm just saying that we, we have this, and you mentioned the trench warfare, right? We have a trench warfare situation because this, long, uh, this war has been prolonged so massively, right? So... so all these narratives of, of hating each other is, is not the same as they were before. The grudges are not exactly the same. So we're going to see new grudges and, and new things and new social interactions form. And I just don't think that the, the Goon uh, history book is closed. On the contrary, I think you are going to see 
a much stronger Imperium. Of course, you so can So, Caleb, say, well, in your world, is there anything I can do? Am I just doomed to failure and death? Well, uh, there is, but... Because not, to me, it not, sounds not, like you're, you're not, setting up this, like, goons okay. are invincible, you can't beat them scenario. Like, I, I, like don't, I, don't buy it. I don't buy that. Like, I don't buy it at all. And, I, and I've seen evidence to the contrary in every single major war in the past to contradict your points. Yeah, well, again, I, there think, are I think ways. what Caleb is saying is that Sit goons down. are like Saiyans and they get stronger every time they get beaten. I'm saying that's a, that's exactly the story of of another leadership uh, uh, in in Eve, which was Sword Dragon, right? He's been around since since well since well, that, he well, was that ended well. Part. Yeah, tell oh. tell us about the fate of Sword Dragon and how he he wasn't you know killable in Eve. Oh, you should listen but to Fridays. Uh... You, that's not that, that's my whole point. You well, have to get why those hundred le- people. This is a to, good example. Vili was actually... the best time zone tanker in the game. I don't know yeah. how he lost. Vili actually said, we're going to attack Guardians of the Galaxies because we want to take away his CSM seat by eliminating his coalition. And when he left, then that was the point, right? Then those groups were not there anymore. This is why I'm saying you have to dismantle those groups. And I cannot see that happening with the Imperium because it, it's not just bound within like a handful of people. This is a hundred people you have to dismantle. So I think Caleb... Uh, illustrates really well why um, nobody reasonably thinks that the the war ends with goons like quitting the game or something like that, right? Um, if we're talking about uh, interpretations, morale preserving, this is why I say Matani is, we haven't even seen his final form and he's unbeatable at this. Um, I'd say he's better at this than anyone who's played a video game ever in terms of uh, making uh, what he has done, Right. Uh, and, and try to enumerate all the things he's done is, is impossible to do. But we're we're listening just perfectly why it's not going to happen. Because we have, I'd say most reasonable people would say that after World War B, the goons were defeated. Um, they moved to Delve and they used their uh, institutional knowledge to completely just outperform everybody, right? They... They discovered the secret sauce and they used it for years before anyone was like, oh shit, they figured out the secret sauce, right? Um, and at the end of World War B, people were re- like too fatigued to follow them to the ed- end of the world and keep going, even though Pro God specifically wanted to, right? He had, a, he had the idea where he would deploy to Delve uh, and, and keep going. But similar to how 1DQ uh, is, is probably the victory condition for most people. Uh, VFK in, in the Casino War, if you want to call it that, World War B1, um, was sort of that victory condition. When goons left Declan, a region that had never been conquered, um, that was kind of the feather in the cap for a lot of the people. And they were just like, eh, we're chilling. We did it. Mission accomplished. Um, we're we're going to have fun and chill now, right? Um, so... I don't know. I, I, I just think Caleb illustrates the point really well. Uh, objectively, if the Imperium, and this is a huge if, right? I don't know why we're even talking about this for so long, because I don't think it's I don't think it's a matter of time for it to happen, right? The, it right. is a big if if the Imperium will will lose. Um, but but if it happens, are they gonna come back stronger the same way? I think Philly is right. The relative strength they had to everyone else. Uh, is probably not going to be matched. Will they exist? Absolutely. Will they be strong? Absolutely. Will they rebuild? Absolutely. Um, but the the mechanics as they exist now are not going to be the same. Um, that said, the Imperium is great at breaking the game, as all EVE players are. The Imperium have institutional knowledge. They have a huge resource that they can tap into, right? We saw them do the war bonds. They raise trillions of ISK. Can they manipulate the markets with trillions of ISK and make money and and build war machines and recruit? Absolutely. Yeah, they're good at that. They understand how the social constructs of the game work and and, and what works. And as the game changes, the Imperium will change with it. Like, that's the important thing to to, to note here. Um, With this war... Both sides have been very good at being fluid and adapting to what their enemy gives them. Uh, the Imperium, they define themselves as Delve as a fortress. They have one constellation left. They no longer define themselves as Delve as a fortress. They, they have Delve as a quagmire where you'll die. 
uh, 1DQ is unassailable. Ha ha ha, jump in and, and try and take it. Right? We have the, the M2 Hell Camp where they're just like, oh, we're going to keep you trapped forever. They see the situation evolve around them and they're willing to make the changes to adapt to it. Right? We're talking about uh, why did they stop the Hell Camp? Right? Um, a part of the reason is a lot of the supers that were trapped, they've got free. They, they see that Pappy aren't going to make the mistake again. They see that the the iHub is very strong or is going to go online in a few hours here. So the, they'll be able to jam the system. And also tomorrow there's a huge timer in F2OY for a Keepstar that if the Imperium is manning the M2 Hell Camp, they can't realistically get to. So they don't want to give away free timers, right? They're adapting to the situation and both sides are adapting really incredibly well to the point where... I wouldn't be able to say who is going to win, right? I think both sides have a pretty strong path, but the the onus is going to be on the leadership, on the, the people within the their respective groups to keep the morale high. And no one's faltered so far, um, which is absolutely incredible, right? It, when we look back at this war in two years from now, five years from now, or whatever, we're going to look back and say, holy shit, how did they do this? How can I, a new alliance leader, emulate what these guys have done in order to keep their members motivated, happy, and showing up to battle in an era where there is scarcity, where everything is more expensive, where everyone's trying to get me to not want to play, <laughs> right? Because that's what both sides are trying to do. They're trying to get the other side to, to lower their numbers a little bit. Uh, last question on this, and then finally we can move on. Uh, but this has been a great review of the war so far. Um, why haven't their numbers dropped yet? Or have they? I think they sort of have a little bit, right? But it's... Um, uh, and Vili can probably speak about this a little bit more. But after the, the initial saber strike to the chest of M2, <laughs> yeah. uh, Pappy forces were, were pretty low. They lost all the headway that they had, more or less, um, in like two weeks. And they slowly had to rebuild it, right? A lot of that uh, was on the shoulders of um, US time zone. I will say, looking back, the Imperium's probably really sad that they let Pittsburgh go. Um, he's not the sole reason, and I, I don't want to throw this on him, but he played a pretty big role in getting Pappy back into this. Right, he started doing uh, his U.S. time zone fleets, uh, started to build momentum on the Pappy side, uh, and Pappy built off that momentum. They went and took all these I hubs. They went and freed some of these supers, um, and just for a few weeks, it seemed like they were able. Pappy were able to just uh, snowball and start taking things back. They were winning fights. There was a period where, for ten days or so that Pappy were winning literally every subcap fight decisively. They controlled all of these iHubs, and, and really it, it brought Pappy back from the brink. I don't know if they were actually on the brink, but it did feel like they might have been on the brink. Um, so th wow. there's been a lot of, of building. And, you know, the Imperium, they witnessed this. They saw this, but they said, hey, our focus is on keeping these guys trapped in M2. Um, so really, it's going to be very telling in the next uh, 10 days or so how the Imperium responds. Historically, they've responded by letting their enemies like peter out their numbers and striking back hard and capitalizing on that. Can they do that again? Probably. That That's what they're trying to do. That's their goal. Well, talk about one motivated FC. Uh, Pittsburgh is... He's motivated. <laughs> like, yeah, in in the chapter or in the book of, of World War II, he's going to have a chapter dedicated to him for for absolutely right. Then, and, and I do think the Imperium are going to regret letting him go. Yeah, because that was a very uh, public and political uh, decision that really put a fire in him that we can see burning uh, burning down parts of Delve. So, okay, um, Vili. Anything else that you would like to add about this uh, whole thing? No, I, I mean, we, we've been. Why weren't extensive. you a guest on? Why weren't you a guest on yesterday's meta show? Since uh, M two is over. Yesterday's the, the meta show. <laughs> what? The meta show that was canceled. 
<laughs> yeah, it was, not, it was a joke. Like, I, cause I, here's the thing, and I want to give you credit for this, uh, among other things. I, people th say I'm on your side and I'm on everybody's side and Eve online when I see good stuff, right? And you basically uh, got the worst of it in M2, but you showed up uh, and to be taunted and you uh, put up with it and you stuck around after even being taunted. Tough time and uh, M2 is over so that you can chalk that up as not only that situation is resolving itself, but we didn't lose too much, but also it created an umbrella which you could really accelerate the war. Uh, kind of a good thing. And you showed up again. So you show up whether it's good or whether it's bad news. And that says something because not everybody does that. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to something else. Um, there's a volcano in Iceland. I heard they there got is. some lava. There is. Apparently, there is a pretty big earthquake over the evening, um, like a 5.0. There's been something like 100 like mini earthquakes, less tremors that have been going on. Uh, and there's actually a website that reminds me, I, I think it was an Eve player that made it. Um, and I'll try and find it to, so I can link it to, to chat. But the website is simply, did it erupt yet? And the, it just right now it just says, nope. <laughs> so uh it, it does seem like an eve player would have made that because there are there are similar things uh for eve yeah um sorry my notes were buried uh the other thing that is going on is i don't have it here but do, do you know the situation with fraternity they're doing all kinds of uh interesting things Uh, yeah, so Fraternity are just consolidating their like space in uh, Veil of the Silent and Tribute, which they recently took uh, two weeks ago, I believe. There was an agreement made with Toilet Paper, or about that long. And they're moving into Vino when it looks like they're uh, probably preparing to uh, invade Fade and Declan pretty soon, so... Yeah. They're also in Poshvin, like there's a situation in... In Poshman, oh, you know? um, something yeah. happened with that. Uh, Streebog and Fraternity reached a peace agreement. Yeah, I guess there was some fighting going on. I, I, they might have been blamed each other. I think her Poshman, uh, Streblog basically came out of Poshman and attacked some structures that belonged to Fraternity, was one thing that I heard. And so Fraternity went into Poshman and started fighting on their terms. And then there was actually, it looked like what was a coalition between Stryblog and their other rivals inside of Poshvin to, to resist a NullSec alliance coming into Poshvin. And then it quickly got resolved with some kind of agreement. Yes. Yeah, uh, like and the least fraternity same. attacked Stryblog first, right? They reinforced one of their structures and then they attacked fraternity's uh, fort, I think it is, in Novola as a like, counter to that. Yeah, they, yeah. Got it. Suchin is right. And then they they like formed a coalition with all the Pochvin guys, kind of like how you know the Wormhole guys, uh, you know, I guess previous to the Hard Nox eviction, kind of always had that kind of uh, Bushido thing where you know we might fight each other, but if any Noxic guys come in, we're all going to band together to keep them out. I think that the Pochvin guys are trying to be like the Triglavian clades, where the clades kind of don't get along with they they bond together to fight the outsiders, right? Yeah, so they're protecting their space. Uh, Vili, you're still here. Do you have any interest in Poshvin? Can I interest you in some property in Poshvin? Um, no, I, I'm okay. Uh, I've heard rental rates are pretty low in Poshvin right now. Um, if you guys have uh, <laughs> some golems you want to sell me there, though, I'm, I might be interested. Uh, uh, just make sure that you tell me when you're going to go run a world arc. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, unfortunately, I would like to keep my golems and not. Get I would like to kill up. your golems. I'm sure you would. You might. You might need a third act. Just keep it in mind, okay? Just keep it in mind. I, I mean, unfortunately, Poshman is is an interesting space right now, and uh, I definitely feel 
and this is more of the CSM village talking than anyone, I guess, is that Posh just needs more reward. It needs more incentive for people to come into the space and more incentive for people to engage in the area. What Posh needed was to not restrict one side of the event that caused it from using the gates, because then we could still have Triglate Meets and fighting each other in Posh Correct. Edencom groups put up structures just like Triglavians when the thing was going into liminality, and we wanted to keep fighting each other. But now we can't fight each other. So. It's almost like they created a cave and only allowed half the people in, and they wonder why nobody was fighting. Yeah, a lot of the Edencom people still feel like we won 50 something systems and technically more than they did, and we get nothing for our standing, and they get this new region. Where's okay. my t shirt? Yeah, I also really hated the fact that CCP let you get positive standings to both Eden Calm and Triggs. Like, I know maybe it triggered, like, some Nolsec guys, like, being shot by one side, like, doing logistics or something in high sec, but it well, kind of I... ruined it for me, man. Was, they, they put out so much, like, uh, so many adverts, right? There was a big one that they had, this blog, where it's something like, you need to pick a side, you know? Yeah. But there's consequences, and then, oh, you just, uh, on your John Freda character, you just use a... a a uh, Pochman filament, shoot one rogue drone, and then then just uh, leave, and th then you yeah, then never you're get fine. Oh, that's how you do it. Yeah, so if you kind of... didn't participate in the invasion at all, and you're zero to both sides, you just have to go shoot one drone. Like, And there are drones that, like, frigates can one-shot. So you go kill one of those, you leave, and you're neutral to both sides, because you're slightly positive, right? Hey, you can just yeah. do it in a, in a Kestrel, one-shot them. I know there's a ton of different things I would have liked to have seen with that. And, you know, like, the, the reality is that the way it's built right now is still not what it needs to be to make the, the region interesting and exciting. In the invasion itself, and a lot of like the liminal systems and the low-sex systems, we had a lot of good fights between the Triglavian groups and the Edencom groups, and we won some and they won some. And it was just like super super fun and we wanted to continue that into potch and it's just really a missed opportunity yeah absolutely uh so, I, I mean to me i think it would be awesome if you know eating calm could start fighting to take back you know the pieces of posh bit by bit right and I mean, there's so many different ways you can narratively do. speaking they they say they are and you see eden Com stuff running around potch but it's yeah, like why couldn't they speaking. be like oh eden Com is hacking the gates so eden Com standing also activates the gates Boom, Pochman's fixed. I did it. Or maybe Edencom <laughs> could reactivate the gates that got disabled when Triglavians right. took over and all the Edencom guys can go through or something. I don't know. Except you can kind of already do that because there's wormholes within three jumps of where they yeah, were. Yeah, I know. But, but like, yeah, that are like static. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, since you're a CSM member, Billy, uh, this is good for you too. Did we uh, did we cover expert systems last Sunday? Was that part of it? We did, right? Or was it? Yeah, we we talked about it. Okay, good. So we did talk about it. Just your comment on it, Villy. What do you think of expert systems? <sighs> okay, um, thanks for the comment. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, last last few topics is um, Arcia. Did you have something going on in low sec or in your? Oh, um... It's not like a gigantic news article. Uh, there was a pretty fun capital brawl between uh, U.S. time zone of snuffed out and the weird coalition of Phoenix Naval Systems, Electus Matari, and Kimi Hadar last night in Manar in Everyshore. Um, and uh, about 100 to 120 people on both sides. Uh, they lost 45 billion of stuff, and we lost 35 billion. Pretty, pretty decent low sec capital brawl, and like, like a one of the few ones without a lot of third parties. But uh, it was, I, I think, honestly, both sides enjoyed that fight just because it was uh, a slugfest that stuff died on both sides. And um, for those who don't know, the writing contest was announced. Uh, last Monday, right. um, the Capsular Writing Contest, where you have a chance to win several billion ESCF prizes. Uh, you basically write a story from the perspective of your Capsuleer in character from uh, 
one of four different categories, and there's ISK prizes. So I'll, I'll link that in chat. Awesome. All right, and also you should know there's a mining contest going on right now. It started at downtime. It ends uh, at the end of downtime. It's in uh, Damalin, actually. Uh, you know anything about that, Arcia, by chance? Uh, yeah, DamFam is run, running a mining contest where uh, they see who basically who can mine the most amount of ore, and at the end they, they pull it all together and, and, and hand it out. Um, it's, I think it's the first time they've done that, done this, but uh, uh, it looks fun for the industrial-minded among us. Yeah, I'm actually headed there right after this show to mine on the Matterall character. I'm going to buy some mining skills. Buying a catalyst, let's yeah. go. <laughs> Just in the gambling is a point five. So, you know, if you're not industrial, you can uh, get, get some catalysts going down there. and <laughs> Run some interference. Are you guys going to be there? It's a collusion, man. We're going to have a uh, code showing up to help Matterall win. <laughs> yeah, Matterall on the back of code coming in. Uh, we'll stop all mining except ours. But I'm on my way there. If you guys want to hang out, Damalin is the place to do it today. Oh, sorry, people listening to the podcast a day later. Speaking of uh, killing stuff, there was actually a really, really fun event, a band apart. Um, you guys might remember or might know uh, Rick Stravix as one of their more notable members. Uh, they held their, I think, seventh annual uh, free-for-all event in Uleta. Uh Yesterday, it went from... Uh, 4 o'clock eve time to 8 o'clock eve time. And there were, like, little prizes. There were, like, fancy ships to kill. Locals stayed between, like, 700 and 1,000 almost the entire time. Uh, they handed out, I think they handed out 6,000 free frigates. Um, and it was just a free-for-all all, all around the system. Uh, lots of stuff exploded. I think they eclipsed 10,000 kills in one system, which is a low-sec record for EVE Online. So congrats wow. to, for, to them for that. Uh, there were some very funny moments. CCP showed up. Uh, CCP Convict died a lot. CCP Felipex died a lot. CCP Fozzie didn't die so much. He let his his uh, bros out to hang. Uh, uh, he left them out to dry, and he showed uh, showed off his superior piloting skills, maybe. Uh, CCP Alpha was there as well. A lot of the community team was there. Um, but the, the real mainstay was... Uh, a band apart handing out thousands of frigates uh and it took them they they built all the frigates too they built fitted and handed out just thousands of these things uh to act as a catalyst for mass destruction uh there are some really cute stories and that made me feel really happy uh some people were posting in local that hey this is the first kill i've ever gotten on uh this is the first thing i've ever done where i've engaged in pvp um some people were sad because dark side showed up in Kestrels and other groups like showed up in uh, other ships to try and uh, feast on it. There are a lot of people with ECM bursts. So oh. it felt like every time you were having like a little 1v1 to the side, uh, someone would ECM burst to get on all the mails. I have no doubt that someone got on like 5,000 plus mails yesterday. Um, but yeah, if you saw a blip on the map in Uleta, that's probably what it was. Uh, and it was really cool. There are still some recordings of it as well. I think Rick's um, on his blog, we'll post a few recordings. But it was really cool, uh, really fun to see, and, and just uh, just a fun moment. Uh, I went there, I was blasting some Michelle Branch and just vibing. Uh, I got a bunch of 1v1s in a free. <laughs> Were you was everywhere like, oh. to me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, actually, that actually was. But yeah, I got a lot of 1v1s. Um, I got blobbed a few times. I brought some of my own frigates and then uh, ran out and just started getting a bunch of free ones at Dock. It open up a trade with someone who was spamming in local trade me for blank and they'd give me a stack of frigates i'd be like sweet and i just <laughs> jump in and undock uh, and for the most part there was no pod killing too so you could just go back to your uh thing and, and get in it was really a ton of fun yeah is that what think... that happened yesterday right yeah that was yesterday mm -hmm. and um like i said i think there's going to be some uh, there are some recordings of it. Uh, maybe some YouTube highlight videos will be made. Some resort photos. Had, um, yeah. They had like Orcas out in space. They had Dreads out in space. They had Kronos is out in space. All at different Celestials. So you could go 
anywhere you went, any celestial you went to, someone was there ready to fight you <laughs> for like three hours straight. It was very cool. Kind of, kind of sounds like a. Well, I won't say. It. Uh, I wonder how expensive the uh, the tags for security status is going to be now, because I know a lot of people are like, oh, I was in this FFA, now I'm minus 10, what the fuck? Yeah, that's definitely going to happen for sure. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, maybe Abandoned Parts uh going to make some money on this because they probably bought a bunch of the tags. Oh, God, I got to sell stock. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Meryl, I, I would like to insist that we start actually keeping a record of, of this whole uh, Arcea versus Elise thing, because I would actually like to see who's actually winning. I think Arcee has got him right now. Yeah, yeah I think Whoa. so too. Yeah. What are we? We just need to pull up the uh, the board of the Amar Championship, I think. It, yeah, is it just so in in tournament record, it's one to zero, Arcea. <laughs> All right. Well, um, last thing, if you guys want to discuss it, you can say no. But um, what do you think of the skill points? Um, that CCP has uh, offer has given out. CCP has offered buying skill points. It's not the first time, but it seemed to be something that people talked about. You guys have an opinion on it? It smells like a little bit of, a, in my opinion, uh, returning veteran retention stuff. When you start looking at the numbers and crunch them, it's really just to get give them a little bit of a what you lost while you were not uh, playing, and yeah, but the it, number it, is minimal. The, the problem, Caleb, I think, with, like, I don't have a problem with them selling the skill points. Like, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a whole lot. And it's actually at a pretty, like, uh, bad price point because, you know, you, like, you get the same skill points you get for subbing for a month from that thing for, like, three times the price. So the, the only people this is aimed at, really, are people who want more skill points on the 80 mil plus SP main. The one thing that I think that uh, really uh, soured it for me is the fact that they kind of marketed this as a, a returning player thing, but literally this is just a special offer available to everyone. So it, it's not for returning veterans, it's for everyone. Like, and if they just said that they're selling another skill point pack, you know, I think it probably wouldn't have got the reaction that it did on Reddit as badly. I mean, but there's always going to be people who get offended by CCP making money, but, you know, you yeah, can't but, change but... that. But we haven't gotten the actual uh, criterion because some people have not actually gotten it, which is weird. Like I haven't everyone, gotten any of it. Everyone can get it. You can just go to a, a link. Like it's called like not, special or something. Yeah, but not both of them. I only have. I think I only have the old one. Uh, I don't have the new one available at all. It's not offered to me on any of my accounts. Oh really? I, I can see it on every single one of my accounts, even yeah, the ones. If, that... if somebody sends you the link, you can open it. Ah, okay, so so if I get the link, I can see it, but I, if I just click in on, on the offers, I, I can't for some reason. It, it shows up if you go to the secured or even line page. Uh, it shows up there for me, so... Yeah, that's not there for me. I checked or on the day when everyone was screaming. I went and checked, and I couldn't see it at all. I only saw the old one. Well, I, I, well I, I've well, tested, and I can see it on, like, 10 of my accounts, and, like, four of my accounts have been subbed since, like, 2007, so I'm definitely not, yeah. like, a returning veteran. All right, so any thoughts on that? Uh, there's the whole uh, thing CCP said they would never sell skill points, uh, all that. I, mean, I, don't, I don't really care to, like, it, I mean, it doesn't matter, right, because they, they sell skill injectors already. I know that's already from, like, existing play. like, it already comes from existing players, but for, uh, like, $40 or whatever they're selling this pack for, you can just spin up a, an all, uh, a mega it for three months and extract it at the end so, and get the same amount of skill points, probably, if you have less than 50 million skill points. I it does kind of... Yeah, uh, nails it, right? Uh, it's... It's kind of about the messaging on, on how they did it more than the fact that they did it. Um, I think there are some things where you could message it and it would be like super successful. I know the first time they did it, um, they got dragged, CCP got dragged through the mud for it. But I was also talking to a lot of people who utilized the offer, right? Um, it wasn't unpopular, but I think at that at the time, the price point was way lower. I think it was like $36, you get a month of sub and 2 million skill points or something. So you could uh, take part in the Triglavian invasion, get into the, the trick ships if you forgot about them. And it was messaged and marketed towards uh, returning players rather than just everyone or a lot of people. Um, I, I think there's a lot of ways that they could go about this um, that would seem less skeevy, right? So uh, one of the things that I think people really latched onto was that they, they showed like a price that it was discounted from 
which it wasn't actually discounted from because it was never initially offered at that price point. Uh, and so people were it kind of rustled some feathers. Um, but, but really, I think the main issue with it was the messaging rather than the fact that it happened. I feel like uh, I think the particularly bad thing is when they started allowing skill injecting and skill extracting. I don't think I think after skill injecting and skill extracting is a thing. I don't think it matters anymore if they sell skill points. I think the skill extracting is what just kind of I don't want to say broke everything, like, but it, it made it, it matter did, it less. Did. Yeah, it, but it broke everything. Um, gone are the days where, like, oh, I'm about to punch into a plex on a player. Let me check their their age, the the character age. Right. Like, right. Yeah, yeah and it seems to me it's not really selling SP. This is like a, a one-time special offer. They, I think they've done this before, right? They normally have like they, they have that pack that's still available where you get the 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 uh, cerebral accelerator that lasts for twenty-five days, the expert cere cerebral thing, and then you also get the uh, one point five million skill points. And this is the same. Like as long as they don't go overboard on it or sell like SP directly, if they just have an offer like this every six months, I, I don't really care personally. I feel like they could have done this like after M2 when the hype was high. And I think there's also a way, if the marketing people are listening, I think there's a way you could do this and not anger people or not, I don't want to say anger, but not like rile people up. Just say that this SP came from banned accounts. Um, obviously, think it so it's actually from banned accounts. <laughs> um, but if you just say that, they'll be like, okay, cool. Like the cheaters get punished and I get the profit. Like, and that's the only time they're gonna do it. You know what I think they should have done then? They like they they could have just messaged this with fleet formations because I know uh, a lot of people uh, are complaining oh, yeah. about the SP requirement for fleet formations, right? Because you need to, uh, if you're if you've got any more SP, you need to buy like twenty two injectors or something to get it. So I mean, if they if they just said like, hey, like we understand this is a pain point, but we're selling this uh, skill point pack that you can buy, right? I mean, it, I, I guess that might send another negative message as well. Yeah. I don't know, but that might be a negative. But I like that idea. It's just kind How of how many a SP do you, is the new thing require? How many SP do the fleet formation things require? Uh, it's twenty two injectors for eighty mil SP plus. I think it's I think it's like. 2.5 mil SP is a rank 8 and a rank 2 skill. So it's like 2 mil SP for the rank rank 8 one and it's 1.2 mil. So it's 3.2 million skill points total, I think. That'd be 2.5 mil, sorry. 250k per each rank, so. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's uh, 3.2 mil SP total, 22 injectors if you're uh, 80 mil SP. And that's to unlock the the final form, which is the... all all with a charisma requirement, <laughs> probably remap. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. All right. Um, let's go into last comments and shout outs and that kind of thing. If you guys have anybody you want to say hello to, or or something, uh, some piece of wisdom you want to give the audience. We'll start with our guest, uh, Billy. Have anything you want to end with? Um, it's another beautiful day in Eve. Um, hope you, you guys are all enjoying the weather and, uh, stay safe out there and avoid the lava and COVID. Okay. Uh, oh, one more thing about the weather. Has the electrical storm left 1DQ? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Cause you couldn't cloak with it there. That made things kind of awkward for filming. Yeah. It's, uh, it's no longer there. All right. Uh, any of you other guys just step up panel. I only have one thing. I, I will say that unironically, if CCP had been selling SP for real money since the beginning, so back to when we talked about the whole catch up thing, there's a lot of things that would not have gone as bad as they have done in EVE Online when we talk about things like the ecosystem and zombie farming and all of that drama. So I'm almost inclined to say I would rather that CCP sell the SP than the current SP injection system we have. All right, so people can get into real calls faster and break the game two years earlier? <laughs> Do you think that they could afford that on this scale? Well, I mean, it's easier for someone to spend 40 bucks, right, than to like grind for 10 hours in a super? I don't know. 
But again, then all that money would have gone to CCP and they might actually have had enough money to fix things better because the amount of money they would have gotten if all Rockwell pilots had been actually real money, that would have been a lot. But they still are getting money, right? Because they have to sub their accounts the whole time that they're crabbing to work towards a super and like skill extractors at least have like some kind of thing that CCP is taking off the top, right? Because they have a plex cost. Yeah, a lot of assumptions uh, built into that. Um, Arcia, you were about to say something. Mm, nothing important. Nope. No goodbye to anybody. Did you have a friend out there? Oh, I was just thinking the greatest thing in EVE is when you're flying a bait Punisher and you tackle another Punisher. Because it's like Sch Schrodinger's blob. You're both blobbing and being blobbed. You get to see who's is bigger. <laughs> At least. Any last comments? Uh, yeah, there's there's two. I, I want to give a... With the dismantling of the M2L camp, both sides are going to chest beat pretty hard. I just want to give a, a quick shout out to the Imperium pilots that manned that hell camp for as long as they did. That was pretty cool. It's an in interesting feat in EVE Online. Um, I think the last time we saw something this way is when... It was, it was much easier to do, but it's when uh, Manny locked out everyone from uh, a station that uh, DRF was, was living in, or rather Solar were living in. Uh, so no one could actually get access to the stuff that lasted for quite a while. But this one actually had to be manned. Uh, and Pappy did not make it easy on them. So uh, shout out to that. Uh, also, there is a, a writing contest. Did we talk about the writing contest? Yeah, yeah. I mentioned it. Okay, never mind. I, I want to mention it again, just in case. Do it again. It, Do it again. Yeah, it happened when you contest. weren't listening to Arcia. <laughs> <laughs> Elise just flashbacks. zones out when I talk. Like, ah. Uh, I was getting flashbacks to my retributions dying uh, at RCA's hands, <laughs> but that's okay. But yeah, the, so the, just cool things that happen in the community. Uh, Anger Games have a uh, open practice, I believe, on the 13th. Yes, um, yes. So that's going to be pretty cool. You can watch... Um, you can I mean, watch me just, die. You, you can watch RCA excel and take the Electus Mathari uh, team to victory. And you can also just watch explosions in a competitive EVE environment, which is one of my favorite things to do. Um, so I'll be kind of keeping an eye on that. Uh, but the Anger Games is coming up. That is really cool. I think there was um, uh, a hobo leak that showed some Edencom skins that people were like, oh, what's this going to be? And, and those are, I believe, those are all tournament-related prizes. Um, so they're skins for the Edencom ships because the um, EVENT Alliance Open was uh, sponsored lore-wise by, uh, by Edencom. And, uh, you know, all the trick ships were very expensive. But the, the skins are really freaking cool. Um, they're like this gold paisley type thing on the, the Eden Com ships. And they look, they just like swagger out of control. They're, they're really cool. Uh, so if you gold see that on... Sappy Boys. Yeah, if you see that uh, on Hobo Leagues, that's what that's for. It's not some sort of weird uh, thing. Awesome. All right, and um, for me, a couple of things. One is Damlin going on right now. Uh, go and mine or go and prevent people from mining, I guess, if that's your thing, in uh, Damlin. But uh, shout out to DamFam. Uh, I like those guys. I, I think I'm going to actually spend some time down there and, and live among the, uh, the Minmatar miners for a while. That's probably my next thing. And last thing is, for people who say that I'm uh, anti-Goon Swarm and anti-Imperium, I'm anti-Nullsec pretty much now. So I want you all to die, and I want you to collide into each other and blow up like two planets, uh, because I want to see an incredible multi-ecosystem uh, of new leaders come up with uh, new ambitions and stuff. So if you want to know my true bias... It's to see everything fall apart. Sorry, ending on a sad note. <laughs> Whoops. I don't think that's sad. I think people are also wanting to see that. Yeah. End of an era. Let's end the damn era already. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us, especially Billy uh, and McLeod, who's doing always our video and stuff like that. Uh, Arcia, Caleb, Elise, and Suetonia, thank you, guys, and thank you, audience. We will see you next time on Talking In Stations.